My name is Sadie. A little bit about me is that I was born in 1928. My maiden name is Sadie Grinnan. My husband's name is Dean Sturdivant. And most importantly, I am Henrietta Lax's cousin. We used to call her Henny. Henny was a beautiful thing, with honey-colored skin, a round face, and a smile that made boys act like fools. I really wanted to share Henny's story because I feel like so many people know about these things called HeLa cells, but not too many people know about the woman behind them, so that's why I'm here to tell you about them. Um, it was back in the 1940s, just a few years after Henny and Day had married, and we were all living in Baltimore. Henny and Day lived in these houses that were made for the workers, and I used to go on the number 26 trolley down to Turner Station to go visit. But it didn't last long. You see, Henny didn't like all the hustle and bustle of the city, so she took her kids and moved back to Clover just a few years later. Henny loved her kids. In fact, I used to watch her for hours as she would braid Elsie's hair. She loved that little girl. It near broke her heart when they had to take her away, but she never forgot her, and she visited her all the time. Henny loved kids. In fact, I often believe that's why she waited so long to get treatment. You see, it would have been almost a fate worse than death for Henny to not be able to have babies. She was so upset. But don't go thinking that Henny was too strict to them kids. In fact, she could be as sweet with those darlings as she was strict. Oh, Lord, Henny found Lawrence down by the pier after she went and told him not to go, and she went down there with a switch. Yes, Lord, she pitched the boogie like I'd never seen. She was tough. Nothing scared Henny. But she had to be. You see, ne Henny never had it easy. Elsie had barely been gone a year when, before Henny got sick. I still remember the night she told me. I feel a lump, she said, and she had me put my hand right on her stomach. I told her I didn't know what I felt. Maybe you're pregnant outside your room. That can happen, you know. But she was mighty sure it was something bad. But she told me not to worry. In fact, I barely thought of it that much until a few it was a good time later when we were all at the carnival. Me, Margaret, that's my sister, and Henny. We were at the Ferris wheel. We were to way at the tippity top, overlooking Sparrow's Point, and she told us about the cancer. I was shocked and kind of scared, but Henny told me she'd be fine. She'd get some treatment and everything would be okay. But it wasn't. But one afternoon a while later, she was lying on the couch, and she showed me what that treatment was doing to her. Henny, I said, they burned you black as tar. They were supposed to be making her better, but I was looking at my cousin, and this didn't look like it was helping her at all. Penny didn't just fade, you know, her looks, her body. Like some people be sick in bed with cancer, and they look so bad. But Henny didn't. The only thing you could tell was in her eyes. Her eyes were telling you that she wasn't going to be alive no more. But even so, I could barely believe it when she was gone. We were always so close, even though we were eight years apart. But when they... When they opened that pine box and... Sorry, I, and, and I thought I saw her, her toenails. Penny would have rather she'd rather die than let her toenails chip like that. But I just try to remember all the happy memories we had, like when we were kids, we would go dancing, and every time we went to the club, and we saw El, uh, Jealous Ethel running in the door, we'd go running out to the next club we could find, roaring with laughter as we went. And then there were the times we all used to play bingo on Henny's living room floor. With me and Margaret and Henny, we barely had enough money to get by, but somehow we found enough pennies to throw in a pot on the floor and we'd play bingo for hours. With Henny's babies all around us laughing, playing with the chips, we had some good times. <laughs> oh, Henny, I miss you. But somehow your cells just keep on a-growing. Oh, Lord, when I heard about them cells, I thought couldn't have been something live got up in you. But it all just don't seem right, you know. These other people, they be are making billions and billions, and so many people don't even know my dear cousin's name let alone remember her struggling family. Hi, I'm Henrietta Sud Lawrence. She died when I was young. I don't remember her much besides being stripped and pretty. She was very pretty. But after her death, my father was stuck working two jobs, so I had to drop out of school at 16 to raise my bro younger brother, Deborah. But then I was drafted into the Korean War, so my, some cousins had to take care of him until I married Bobette. We raised the youngest ones up and kept them in school and everything. I remember the first time I heard about my mother's cells. Bob had been in a friend's house all day, and then I, she came home yelling something crazy about my mother being alive still up in Washington, D.C. And I just knew that was crazy. I'd seen them bury her myself. But then Bobette told me they took her cells and she was still alive, and they'd been testing them for years. And so I called up my father and asked about him, and he said something about Topsy down at Hopkins. So then I picked up the phone and just called Hopkins and asked if they ever had a, pe a patient named Henrietta Lack. And they told me, no, we don't have no record of that patient here. They never heard of Henrietta Lack. But I think it's all right because those cells help people. They're a miracle. My mom has been curing diseases even when she's not alive. And I hear by 2050 they'll be able to inject babies so they'll live up to 800 years old. And they help curing diseases like blindness and polio. It's a miracle. She's a true miracle. 
But it's a shame those doctors and scientists are making millions curing people and leaving the laxes down here with nothing. They're up there rolling in the money and we are living in poverty. I mean, how could they just leave the children on miracle cells like that? That's just not fair. Hi, I'm Bobette Lax. I used to be Bobette Cooper before I married Lawrence. That's Henrietta's son. So I'd be your daughter-in-law. But I didn't know much of Henrietta. She died when Lawrence was young, and I married Lawrence when I was 20. So I don't really know her at all, except her memory and her children. I raised her children uh, after Lawrence was done in the war, and we married. We took them from Ethel and Galen. They were just plain nasty to those kids, but we raised them good. We kept them in school and educated and respectable. And even when uh, Dale wanted to drop out of school at 13, I kept her in there. I said, you get an education, I told her. You get an education, because that's your only hope. And even when she was pregnant, I had her still in school. But we're here to talk about Henrietta and her immortal cells. That's what they call them. I found out back in 73. I was at my girlfriend's house having lunch, and her brother-in-law was in town. I can't remember much of his name, but I do remember he worked for something science He was from Washington, D.C. And when he found out my name was Black, he kept asking me questions about Henrietta. So I asked why he wanted to know so much, and he told me that they had her cells up in Washington, D.C. And they were doing tests on them. And that just sounded crazy to me. They had a part of her up in D.C. But then he started telling me that they got him when she was alive and they were still growing. And, well, I had to run right home to tell Lawrence. Because everyone was asking about herself, he told me. And even when I told Lawrence, he didn't quite believe me until I started explaining. And then even later, when I got the whole story, I didn't quite believe it. But of course, now I do now that everyone's asking me about it. And I wasn't the least bit surprised when I found out it was Hawkins that took herself. They have been mistreating black patients for years, kidnapping them right off the street, and news them for testing. Those doctors just don't care at all, and they say that she donated those cells. She didn't donate them, they stole them right off of her. Scientists and whatnot that run around with her cells, not even giving a call to relax her. They don't even care. They didn't even tell her husband that happened. Then that just ain't right. I always have a hard time telling my family who I want to meet. I think I'm different from them, but I don't really know why. They sent me to this horrible place. I hate my life here. No one cares about me, and I never see my family. I feel sick all the time. No one understands me. I have not seen my mom in forever, and I don't think I'll ever see her again. Hello, everyone. I'm the older brother, David's son, you see. And, uh, but everyone called me Sonny. I don't like to meet with or tell any journalist anything about my mother. I don't know what happened to my mom when I was very really young, but when I was really, really young, I got a tested for positive TB. I graduated from high school and I joined the Air Force. I grew handsome and uh, I became a big man in my family. I tried to stay out of trouble and uh, I found, later on, I found John Hopkins make money out of selling cells of my mom. Um, I started to telling siblings and warn other people to stay away from my, mom, my mother's cells. And uh, I stopped them, ask, I tried to stop them asking anything about my mom's information. I remember that night, I was with Deborah, but the second day, I saw Deborah die, and uh, I tried to uphold Deborah's desire to gain recognition from my mom, and tried to do everything to accomplish her dream. Hello, my name is Deborah Lack. I am the second daughter of Henrietta and Dale Lack. Growing up, my family had a lot of financial stress with my mother's medical bills and the economy. After her tragic death, my older brother Lawrence and his wife took us kids in. I hated my life as a young adult. I was abused and got pregnant as a teenager and dropped out of school against my sister-in-law's will. Many years after my mother's death, I learned of the medical work being done on herself. I was appalled. My mother needed to rest in peace, and the scientific practice on herself did not allow her to do so. I was hesitant to work with Rebecca, but we became close friends because of our time spent together working on her book. I helped her with my mother's past, and she helped me to cope with the HeLa cells. She took me to see the HeLa cells and comforted me when I felt depressed about not knowing about my younger sister, Elsie. The time I spent with Sloot was precious, and she helped put my life into perspective. I suffered from a series of strokes that made me realize what I had accomplished in my life. And I died knowing I will rest with my mother and Elsie. Hello, I'm the fifth child, Joe. 
I tested for, t um, I tested for TB when I was very young, and I was found that I had the worst of easiest range. I stopped feeling pain and uh, only felt range when I was very young. I became the youngest and the meanest child and uh, went to the military at 18 years old. But it just made me more angry than before. I remember that day. There's a guy whose name is Ivy. He was fighting with my another friend. I tried to stop him, but Ivy hit spit on me. So I decided to kill him. And uh, after I killed him, I went to my family, and my family sent me back to the to my hometown. And uh, I picked up fights with my cousins, and I threatened to kill them. After all, I finally went to jail. After I came out of jail, I changed my name to Zakira. Until one day, I heard some information about my mom, and uh, my brothers, my brothers, sisters, and I went to the hospital together. We finally found out that my mom's cells were studied by other doctors without telling us. Eventually, um, even though they paid money back for studying for my mother's cells, I still feel angry about it. But finally, I changed my attitude and I became friendly and not to my family. I spent a lot of time to stay with my family and I smell often. That's me, Joe. Hello, my name is Christina Lee. I'm from Hong Kong. And I'm one of many young oncologists working at John Hopkins as a cancer researcher. I've been using HeLa cells throughout my whole career and as well as PhD students. And it's helped me to create a technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization, also known as FISH. This technique calls for the coloring of person's chromosomes with um, fluorescent dyes that shine bright on their ultraviolet light and can reveal information about a person's DNA. In appreciation and respect for the Black family, I gave them a print of Henrietta's um, chromosome using this technique called FISH, and I gave it to Deborah. Also, towards respect for the family, I asked them to come into my lab, and I gave them a tour of the freezers. I also showed Deborah and Zacharia their mother's cells under a microscope. I believe that the family should receive the recognition they deserve, and also receive the profits that they exploited them. My name is John Moore. I was a surveyor in an Alaskan, Alaskan pipeline and I thought my job was killing me. I had bleeding gums, bruises all over my body, and my stomach was swollen. Turns out I had hairy cell leukemia, a deadly and rare form of cancer. My spleen was filled with malignant blood cells until it bulged. A normal spleen weighs about one pound, mine weighed 22. I was referred to Dr. David Gold, a prominent cancer researcher at UCLA. After he removed my spleen, I had many follow-up appointments, and after a while, I started to get suspicious about why I had to keep going. He tried to force me to sign all my blood and bone marrow samples he collected over to the UCLA. The first time, I circled I do, because I didn't understand the form. The second two times, I refused to sign, and eventually sent the form to my lawyer. It turns out, Gold is marketing a cell line using my cells called Mo. I felt this was dehumanizing me. Apparently, my cells contained a rare protein that could be used to treat disease, cancer, and possibly AIDS. In 1984, I sued Gold and UCLA for deception and using my body without my consent. I claimed property rights on my tissues, and I was the first person to legally state claim to my own tissue and sue for profits and damages. Unfortunately, my lawsuit was thrown out of court, and I couldn't sell my own cells because Gold was happening to them. Healer cells were used as proof in this case that people did not care about their cells, but I cared. It was dehumanizing me. I appealed in 1988 in the California Court of Appeals, and they ruled in my favor, pointing to the Protection of Human Subjects and Medical Experimentation Act. But then Gold appealed and won. Nearly seven years after I had first faced this claim, the Supreme Court of California ruled against me in what became the final decision. The judges did agree that there was this lack of consent, but ultimately argued that giving patients property rights might hinder medical research.